Hi there. There's something that always strikes me when we are reading a book of the Bible. I mean, for those of us who read the Bible regularly, we get used to reading the Bible in small chunks, don't we? Hopefully every day, by the way, and that is a wonderful thing to do, and we must do that. And yet sometimes I feel it stops us from getting an idea of the bigger picture. And I hope that as we study books of the Bible here at The Living Room, that it helps you to see more of the structure of a book and even a through line of the book. And as we do, we find out that writers don't just chuck together a, like a hodgepodge of memories and ideas, but an inspired and a coherent through line that really works towards a central point. Well, over the last two talks in the book of Acts, we've been examining Stephen's sermon and that led, of course, to his death, and we'll read about that again today. But in that sermon, we find two things, of course. I wonder if you can remember them. There were two accusations against Stephen. One was about his ideas of the temple. And of course, what we find out was that the temple was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The temple is pointing towards Jesus Christ. It's a model to, to symbolize everything that Jesus has done for us. So his mercy and forgiveness and closeness is now found in him. Um, rather than having to go to a temple for that. So the location of worship is anywhere, anywhere, because Jesus can be with us everywhere. So travel to Jerusalem is interesting and it's really enriching. I would love to go myself, but it is not a requirement for worship of God. But the second thing, of course, that we saw was about the law. And the law was fulfilled in Jesus Christ too. And that means that he has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And we looked at the implications of that last time we were in the book of Acts with the idolatry of stuff and the superiority of theological position and yet rejection of the very God that the law pointed towards. Well, Stephen is drawing out the logical conclusion that God is aiming at all along. Ability to be worshipped anywhere and by anyone who comes to the Lord Jesus as Lord and Saviour. For mercy, for forgiveness, for closeness that the temple was po pointing to, and for the purity that the law required. So what are the implications? Now, it's great to have a sermon like that, Stephen, but what's meant to happen now that we hear a sermon like that? Well, the implications are no boundaries, no second-class citizens, even if you haven't grown up with some kind of Jewish tradition. And with that said, what is Luke going to tell us about next? Well, I think you're going to find this really interesting today. I'm Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here at the Living Room Church. Welcome to our talk time. Well, let's read Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through to chapter 8, verse 1. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. 
Well, we've looked at some of these verses before. Of course, the stoning of Stephen, who is famously the first Christian martyr of the church. But we're also introduced to someone who's going to become this book's main character, I guess we could call him, in a couple of chapters. And as I've said before, Stephen's sermon is the introduction to the idea that God is on the move and he's not limited by what there was in Judea. It's plainly declared here, but even in Stephen's vision of heaven, he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now that apparently is something quite strange in the New Testament. And if you were to look at the right hand of God, you would usually see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Any Bible app will give you multiple references for that. But here he is standing. Standing for what? Is he standing to welcome Stephen? Does he do this for every believer? Well, maybe. Standing because he is acting absolutely. Seated is usually something you do when you've finished your work. Standing when you're acting. And we can see the actions of Jesus even in Stephen. Stephen, we have to say, is a little like Jesus in his death. Um, being falsely accused of blasphemy against the temple and against the law, just as Jesus was. Like Jesus, an innocent man about to die. Yep. Stephen, just like Jesus, says, receive my spirit. Except, and this is really meaty stuff, as Jesus prays to the Father at his death, Stephen prays to Jesus in his death. Stephen, like Jesus, prays for his oppressors. Stephen says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. As Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Yet Stephen's death also begins the persecution that drives the Christians from Jerusalem to the rest of the country and even to Samaria. Now, more on Samaria in a moment, but notably, the apostles don't go. And that's an important note. Hold on to that idea. You do need that for our talk today. Keep that in your head for a little later. But in trying to quash the spread of Christianity, those who are doing this persecution actually and inadvertently help to spread it. But the, the brutal murder of Stephen, which really has this kind of mob feeling and mentality to it, it's described by Luke in the most peaceful of manners. It really is incredible when you think of how horrific a stoning must be. And he fell asleep, it says. What a contrast to the murderous anger that caused his stoning in the first place. His body is buried with the dignity of devout men and we have to add here brave men because they're very much at risk of persecution too. Contrasted with the brutality of Saul, not only standing complicit with those who did the stoning, but then going on to ravage the church, which is a Greek word to describe something brutal and cruel. Ravaging the church. And no one is spared. doesn't matter if you're male or female. A little bit like what we've seen in the streets of Moscow as people have dared to protest against the Kremlin for the war on Ukraine. Well, let's read on and let's find out some more implications of Stephen's death and the scattering of this church. Let's read chapter 8, verses 4 to 8. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Now that the church has been scattered, what do they do? Hide? Do they bide their time and shut up about Jesus and sneak back into Jerusalem when things quieten down again? Well, no, the absolute opposite. And the attention moves from Stephen the deacon to Philip the deacon. Now, how do we know that it isn't Philip the Apostle? Well, one of the original 12, remember, the Apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So that's how we know that this is the Philip that's mentioned as one of the deacons. And he's in Samaria. Now, short potted history of Samaria. 
They're like half siblings of the Jews. When the kingdom of Israel was divided after they moved into the promised land, after King Solomon's reign, um, the, the northern kingdom um, was ruled by a man called Jeroboam and the southern kingdom uh, of Judah, hence the Jews, by the way, uh, was ruled over by Rehoboam, who was one of Solomon's sons. So the northern kingdom hadn't got Jerusalem, they didn't have the worship of the tabernacle, the temple, and therefore they started having to try to have their own kind of religion and they set up a calf and they worshipped it and so really because they'd started to mix in pagan things with their roots of what Moses had given them um, at Sinai really they had start, started to have this quasi mixed religion and kind of Jewish but loads of other false things too so they were invaded by the Assyrian Empire as a judgment of God they intermarried and indoctrinated them and so by the time we arrive in the New Testament well the Samaritans are just viewed as half-breeds and people who didn't worship God properly and so that's why there was this animosity between them such was the disdain for Samaritans that even James and John two of Jesus closest disciples asked if Jesus should call down fire from heaven on them because they hadn't accepted them gladly. So Philip is in Samaria and that should be a surprise to us um, because well we're going to find out much more about this work and of the gospel in Samaria because this is the place where Jews hated the most probably even more than non-Jewish people but such is the hatred that the Jews had towards Samaria that they would even take huge detours to avoid this area this territory but this is a place where the response is so great that there is much joy in the city and as we read on uh, that means that they're becoming Christians too because they're going to be baptized in verse 16 in the name of the Lord Jesus. We shouldn't miss the significance of this. There is no place on this earth where Jesus' love cannot reach. There is no boundary to his love. God can be worshipped anywhere and by anyone now. There is no place where he is to be left out. No people that are to be excluded from hearing, even if that means people that we don't like. Or that the Jewish people at the time didn't like or the Jewish Christians didn't like um, or didn't think would ever change even if they did hear. And so we can now begin to fast forward this into our own culture, our own day-to-day -day life. Who are the no-go people in our culture? Are they people from other religions? Are they people who maybe take drugs or maybe secular people or LGBTQ plus people or social media influencers or politicians. Who are the no-go people in our time? There may be many places where we feel there are closed doors or ears that just don't want to hear, but sometimes they are of our making. And if we learn anything here, it's that the proclamation of Jesus must go everywhere and God can do something through it. Well let's read on, we're going to read Acts 8 now verses 9 through to the end of verse 24. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest saying this man is the power of God that is called great and they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptised, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you. 
because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So we meet a magician called Simon and he, he does seem like this incredible man of influence and he talks himself up as well. You notice that too. And people listen to him, almost revering him as some kind of demigod himself. And he makes a profession of faith. And it all looks genuine, of course. And Simon follows Philip around, little my, me in my shadow. And Philip is in preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. It should go without saying that there is no good news without Jesus. I'm talking about the kingdom that Jesus has created. There is no true evangelistic preaching without talking about Jesus, who is the Christ. Well, verses 14 to 24, they're very strange. Up until now, after the day of Pentecost, which was a one-off experience, remember, for those first followers of Jesus falling right on the day of the festival of the first fruits of the harvest, those who had become Christians after that had received the Holy Spirit there and then. In Acts 2, there's no mention of the apostles needing to go around all of the thousands of people that became Christians that day, laying their hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. We simply read about a growing community of believers who've been baptized and the presence of the Holy Spirit is in their midst. We see subsequent fillings of the Holy Spirit, but they are not what we have described in these verses that we've just read. For the rest of the book of Acts, when someone repents and believes and is baptized, they receive the Holy Spirit straight away, even before baptism, by the way. But there are some, and I wouldn't count myself as one of them, who believe that this passage gives some kind of a precedent for a two-stage experience of being a Christian even if this is the only time where this happens, they still create a theology around it. And the idea is that someone might become a Christian, even be baptized, but there remains a further work that needs to be done through the laying on of hands by an apostolic type person, church leader, etc. And it's only at that moment that they come into a fuller experience of being a Christian because they finally receive the Holy Spirit at that time. Now you can see that this, if, if this would be correct, is following the events that we see happening in these verses. Remember again, the apostles had stayed in Jerusalem. They weren't there in Samaria. And when the people had become Christians before, it was under their teaching and under their baptisms. And so you might be tempted to think that Philip's preaching and teaching and baptisms aren't quite up to what the apostles do and say. So it needs their authoritative presence and blessing to finish the job off. Well, I don't believe that this is what's happening in this chapter at all. Let me take you back to the previous chapter. Stephen has preached his socks off about how Jesus is the glory of God, the glory that the temple had and the perfect law keeper. He could be worshiped anywhere and by anyone. So what do we see in chapter 8? Right back to where the woman at the well was told in John chapter 4 verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming. And is now here when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Samaria was the place where any Jew would be really sceptical of repentance and faith and becoming Christians. So what we see in the apostolic involvement is not because it needs some kind of supplementary teaching that Philip hasn't done and hasn't been able to give a good job of. No, this is authentication by the apostles. Um, that indeed salvation has been given 
even to the ones that they considered the worst of enemies, to the Samaritans too. And this is the first time that Christianity has spread outside of Israel. So it needs Luke to give it a special mention, doesn't it? The apostles will not be some kind of Holy Spirit dispensers or inspectors or bartenders. Here's the real point. What if this was the theology that we would construct? What if the Christian experience was a two-stage experience? What if Stephen's sermon was not true? Then we would have superior Christians that had to wait, or inferior Christians who had to wait for superior ones to come along. We would have second-class citizenship for non-obeyers of the Jewish law, possibly, or worshipping at the Jewish temple, possibly, or Christians who are not able to fire on all cylinders because they don't have the Holy Spirit yet because somebody hasn't come and laid hands on them and prayed for them. But Stephen has just dispelled that myth in his sermon. God is on the move everywhere among those who believe in Jesus and obey God. And what we see here is simply a need for the apostles to see it for themselves and give their blessing on it too. And so everyone, if you accept after this event, that Samaritans are just as much Christians as any ethnic Jewish believer. And as for Simon, well, we can deal with that quite quickly. There are no Holy Spirit dispensers. There are no power brokers. You can't buy your way into this and say, well, can I be one of those people that can do the laying on of hands, please? You can't manipulate Jesus or the Holy Spirit. And there aren't special people who alone are able to lay on hands or give people the Holy Spirit. And his closing lines in verse 24 demonstrate that Simon just has a lack of repentance anyway. And his, his conversion is probably phony. So over to us. How do we conclude what we've just read in these amazing verses? Well, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Saviour, if you've asked him to forgive your sinful rebellion against him, if you've asked him to come into your life and be your king, then you're saved. And at that moment, you are given the Holy Spirit of God to confirm to you that you are his. Does that mean that we don't need subsequent fillings? Well, absolutely no way. We need loads of subsequent fillings, don't we? Even the apostles needed subsequent fillings. And so we must too. But you're not a second class citizen, a second class Christian, because you don't speak in tongues or do signs and wonders. And more on that as we move on into the rest of this amazing book of the Bible. But we need to ask ourselves a question. Does God have all of me? Does God have all of you? Because if he doesn't, then sin is hindering our prayers. Sin is hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we're holding back from him and not following him truly and not obeying him truly, we are resisting the Holy Spirit through our lack of obedience and what God wants us to do. So let's do what every Christian should do. Every day we could even say, because we're part of God's family, let's come and confess and let's pray that God can use us and fill us and guide us. Lord, we just want to come to you now. And for those listening who aren't Christians, uh, maybe they really want to know that you could be powerful in their lives, Lord. They don't have the Holy Spirit because they're not yours yet. And so we pray that you would help them to come to you in repentance and in faith. Lord, that right now they would pray to you and say, please forgive me. I need you and I need help. Lord, we just pray that as they would repent and believe, Lord, that you would come in and dwell in their lives by your Holy Spirit and help them every day. And Lord, for those of us who, who've maybe been listening to this talk, who are Christians, Lord, how we need to admit that sometimes we lack your presence or your power because of our own lives, because we are the ones who have been foolish. We are the ones who've maybe un- unrepentant sin, um, unconfessed sin. Lord, we're the ones that have work to do. So, Lord, we just want to take a moment now to ask for your forgiveness. Lord, for the things that we have done that displease you, that things that we have not done that we should have done, 
the things that we have done that we should never have done. Lord, how we ask for your forgiveness. We pray that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness because that is what you promise. Lord, we want to thank you for the work of Jesus and that because of his power and his authority and his work on our behalf, Lord, we can be precious in your sight and pure and clean children. But Lord, we need your power, so we pray that you would fill us with your spirit again. Lord, we know that we need to come to you in confession. But Lord, how we ask that you would help us, guide us, strengthen us, fill us. And Lord, we just want to bring glory and honour to your name. So we pray that you will do that so that we can honour you properly. Lord, thank you. Thank you for our time. Thank you for what we've seen. Thank you that there are no second-class citizens now in Christianity. And especially thank you, Lord, that you love us and you love everyone. And there are no boundaries to your love. So send us where you want us to go, to the people that you want us to speak to. Help us not to be a hindrance for that. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you once again. Come back next week. We've got even more. God bless you.